Welcome to a podcast about wealth and life. We all know that our finances play a big part in how we live our lives. In this podcast, the advisors from Foster and Motley share insights and information about investment and financial planning topics and how they connect to your life. We had been living with interest rates at historically low levels, but that has changed. The Fed has raised its target rate several times this year and may do so again in an effort to deal with inflation. Foster and Motley's Dave Neenaber and Rachel Rasmussen note these increases are being felt not only in financial markets, but in our everyday lives. Uh, Dave, things had been pretty good for borrowers, but they've gotten a lot rougher, haven't they? Absolutely, Patrice. We are in a period of really significant change, and it's happened quickly. In a period of six months, uh, we've really seen the impact on borrowers and savers. We've seen that change quite a bit. You know, Rachel, you think about the previous environment, and it was a great time to be a borrower, but that's changed quickly, hasn't it? Oh my gosh, my have the tables turned. Interest rates are so important, not only to borrowing costs, but there are huge impacts to stocks, to other kinds of bonds like corporate bonds, to to real estate, borrowing costs for real estate, whether you're investing or borrowing for your mortgage, all areas of the market are impacted by rates. So we're seeing something going down that's historically very significant and it's impacting people on a day-to-day -day basis in their personal finances. So it's really at the forefront of people's minds along with historically high inflation. Now we're trying to fight that high inflation with some higher rates. So, I mean, if you look at why these rates are fluctuating, if you look at the short term, um, in the short term, it's really controlled by the Federal Reserve. So they're setting the borrowing costs between banks on overnight deposits and without getting too complicated there, they have a target that is much higher than it's been in several years. Their desired endpoint, at least at the time of this recording, is around 4.4 to 4.6% by 2023. And if you think about where we were in 2020 at zero, that is a huge change. In the longer run, it's really the markets that are determining the rates. And I, I think Ryan and Sarah, they recorded a podcast on the yield curve not too long ago. And Sarah explains this really well, that the long-term rates are more mirroring what we expect long run GDP to look like. So it's it comes down to also supply and demand of lending and borrowing. How expensive is the borrowing going to be? So Dave, you see how interest rates are impacting people on a day-to-day -day basis as a financial planner. Tell us about some of the biggest impacts that you see on people, maybe some of their biggest expenses. What are you seeing when you're meeting with clients? Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. We see the world from a different viewpoint, I think, with Rachel, you being on the investment side and the impact of interest rates and me being on the financial planning side, I think it's impacting a lot of things. Mortgage is probably the number one thing that's top of mind for me. It's, it wasn't so long ago that our clients were out there getting mortgages for 30 years at two and 3%. And that's changed really quickly. And now you're seeing rates six, even pushing 7%. When you think of anyone's budget, the housing cost and servicing a mortgage, that's always at the top of the list. And the type of mortgages that we're seeing people take. When you could get money at two and 3%, why wouldn't you lock it up for 30 years and get a long-term mortgage? Um, it'll be interesting to see with folks that may stay in a house for seven to 10 years, will they take out a 30-year mortgage? Maybe they do adjustable as rates go up to try to make it more affordable. To your point earlier, Rachel, uh, what seems like Oh, heck, 4%, that's not a huge move. But when you're coming off of zero, it really is a big impact. And we're seeing that with the mortgage cost. I have to think, Rachel, that the increased rates are going to cool off housing. Can you explain a little bit of kind of how that works? If you think about how much goes to interest, when you look at your monthly payment, the higher the interest rate, the more of your payment that goes to interest and not paying down your loan. So a big move in interest rates can really affect housing affordability because the payment on a monthly basis is going to go up as interest rates go up. 
I mean, one example of this, and Dave and I were talking about this earlier this week. I mean, if you are borrowing, let's say just $300,000 on a 30-year mortgage, and the mortgage rate used to be at 3%, well, let's say now it's 7%. In the 3% example, your monthly payment was $1,265. So over the life of the loan, the total interest that you would pay is about $155,000. Compare that to, say, 7%, your new monthly payment is $1,996. So you'll go from $1,200 to $2,000. Wow, that hurts. And then the total interest rate that you pay over the life of the loan, it's not 155 anymore. Now it's nearly 420,000. It's 419,000. So you look at that and you say, wow, housing affordability is going to become even bigger problem than it was. And that tends to over time put pressure on prices because people just can't afford the house anymore. So you triple the amount of interest you pay, you nearly have 60% increase in the monthly payment. That really matters. Of course, it also impacts the equity. No, David? Yeah. And 700 bucks a month. I don't care what family you're talking to. That's real money. Um, And that is a huge increase going from a 3% to 7% mortgage. And to your point, Rachel, that you're paying more in interest and you're building equity slower. So I've seen that as kind of a key driver in housing prices. People were just, their house was growing and growing and that gave them the equity to then go out and perhaps upgrade their home. And as rates go up, you're just not going to see that equity that's it's not going to build as quickly with these higher interest rates. Well, what about areas outside of your home, other areas that you're borrowing and say maybe a business loan or a rental property? Because a lot of folks are borrowing on those as well. Yeah, I think we're going to see rates higher than mortgages. So if mortgages are six and a half, seven, a lot of those are going to be eight, nine percent. Um, and unlike homes that you tend to have a 30 year or 15 year amortization. A lot of those loans, whether it's for rental property or a small business loan are going to turn over every five to seven years. So you're going to start to see that impact of higher rates and higher borrowing costs uh, hit them quicker than you are someone with a 30 year mortgage. The rates, they're going to impact a lot of other parts of the economy. It's not just housing. You're going to see it on cars. I think we all got lulled into thinking 0% car loans would be here forever. And now we're seeing the reality of four or five, 6%. And if you want to get a used car, it's going to be even higher. And if you have poor credit, it's going to be even higher than that. So it's not just housing, but uh, I think you'll see the impact of higher rates impact the, uh, the car market as well. And of course, credit cards have always been high interest loans. We always encourage folks to pay those credit cards off on a monthly basis and not incur interest costs. But Heck, those were at 16% as a national average, and that's quickly going up to 18%. So it's just impacting a lot of different parts of the economy. Man, in an investment world, you try to get a margin loan on some of your brokerage accounts. I mean, in the olden days, it felt like you were getting free money, borrow off of your investments. You can use a custodian like Schwab to kind of float you. Let's say you're in between a home and you need to kind of bridge the down payment margin loan has been a good way to go, or at least it has been. Now you're looking at rates starting at nine and a half percent on these short-term borrowing costs. Who? Ouch! <laughs> I couldn't believe when I saw that email come through. Nine and a half percent is the starting rate for a margin loan. Man, and if the market's going down because interest rates are causing some fluctuation in stocks. I mean, you don't want to get that call where you need to start selling to to kind of meet your minimum uh, threshold. You, you don't want to get yourself in that position. So beware of market declines when you're borrowing on your investments. Um, but- yeah, and that's been a popular area for clients to access equity and have some sort of a bridge loan, as you described, Rachel. But certainly the environment of increasing rates and decreasing market values is can put uh, margin borrowers in a tough spot. What about with our client? How have they been dealing with some of these higher borrowing costs? Well, it's it impacts everyone a little bit different. Um, you think about housing costs for those that are locked in a 30-year mortgage, they'll never want to move. If they're paying two and a half or 3% interest, why would they ever want to move? No kidding. Um, so, Get comfy. <laughs> so maybe uh, 
continue that trend we saw in 2020 of everyone focusing on home improvements and fixing up what they have as opposed to moving. The other area that I've seen interest rates impact our clients is around family loans. And you just think about with housing getting so expensive that your typical 25, 27 year old that's graduated from college and going out to buy a house, it just hasn't been practical for them to make a down payment and qualify for a tr traditional mortgage. So we've certainly seen a number of family loans where a family member steps in and acts as the bank and helps someone acquire a property. But there are some pitfalls to that too. You, you know, you want to make sure that it's a, um, that you have a formal note in place and you have a formal payment set up and just act like the bank would act. Uh, make sure there's insurance on the property and have a lien against the property. So family borrowing has been really common. I expect that to continue. It helps both sides. It helps the family members that are loaning the money earn some interest while uh, giving access to credit for the younger generation. Oh, that's a good idea, especially dealing with some of the affordability issues that we were referencing. Absolutely. And we've seen it with the housing market and other parts of the country has been wild. So it seems like a lot of uh, help to buy homes in California and Colorado, much more so than here in Ohio. So it's not just borrowing, as we've kind of focused on so far with mortgages and family loans, but higher interest rates are going to impact your investments as well. So Rachel, why don't you talk a little bit about cash, the thing that has earned zero interest for so long, what's going on in the cash world? Cash. Who's been talking about cash? Uh, now it's starting to get more interesting. Cash is an asset class. Go figure. And so it's finally time to reevaluate your cash. So if you look at your bank account, the, many banks are still paying very low rates. And I have to say, they're probably earning a lot on that money. If you look at money markets at Brokerage firms, you can see that they're north of 2%, now close to 3% just on wow. your cash. I mean, that's a huge change. That's completely different than where we were back in January. So you're finally getting paid to have cash in the bank, and that's a welcome change. But it's not all banks, right? There's a lot of banks out there that are still offering very little interest. Good point. It's time to kind of shop around a little bit, see what you can get, because now there's an opportunity cost of letting your cash just sit there not earning very much. So that's a big change. So online savings banks, money markets, there's alternatives to the traditional bank savings account, correct? Yeah. And reach out to your team, to your advisor to talk about your options because we've been pretty active in portfolios. I mean, we've been thinking about ways to get some more money on cash. So talk to your advisor about how you might boost that, that interest rate that you're getting because the, the traditional banks, they're certainly not the only way. Yeah. And I have to think those, the continued increase in rates, it impacts cash, but it seems like it, it's impacting bonds as well. Can you talk a little bit about the current bond market and how quickly this has occurred? Oh my goodness gracious. The bond market this year has been pretty crazy. I mean, when you listen to the news, it's all about what's happening in stocks, you know, because stocks, well, they're down a lot more than they, they have typically been, but the bond market is even crazier. If you look at the past 40 years, this is probably the most interesting the bond market's been in a long time. Um, so in bonds, there's a relationship between interest rates and the price of bonds. As interest rates move up, well, they start looking more attractive, but what about all those bonds that were already out in the universe? Those are paying lower coupons. Yeah. Who wants my 2% bond if you can go out and get a 4 or 5% bond, right? Right, right. So the price of those bonds falls. So there's this inverse relationship to interest rates moving up and the price of ex existing bonds. So we have negative, pretty negative performance in bonds this year. You're talking double digits down in a bond market. That's very, very rare. So when we're looking at markets and what's happening in bonds, bonds are being reported on every day, same as stocks. So it's pretty interesting, but one of the welcome changes that we're seeing is finally, if you lend your money, you can get paid some interest rates. You can get higher interest rates. You can get paid higher coupon. I mean, so Dave, that seems like it has to be a good thing for our clients, right? Dividend income, higher interest rate income. 
it's about time. We were, we've been looking at income and how it relates to portfolios for some time. You know, if you're taking withdrawals out of your portfolio on a monthly basis, well, to the extent that that withdrawal is being covered by just the cash flow from interest and dividends, the better off you're going to be because you don't have to sell in a bad market. You can just get that cash and kind of replenish what you need to take out on a monthly or quarterly basis. Higher interest rates just improves that affordability. So we're pleased to see it. I mean, it's in our view, it's probably been a long time coming, but we're seeing it and we're seeing it in a hurry. So so it sounds like some short-term pain for some longer-term benefits with higher rates, right? Exactly. I mean, you look at stocks and you look at bonds and you, our market commentary has been that those areas have been expensive. They've been expensive for quite some time. And that has always been buoyed by low rates. Well, now that the rates are going up, stock valuations have come down, bonds have gotten more of more uh, attractive. So we think it's a good thing in the long run, but my, has it been painful in the short run? So we often hear from clients, you know, what's going to happen to interest rates. Tell me a little bit about predicting what's going to happen with rates and how we think about that. It's really difficult to predict what will happen with rates. So you can sit at zero and say, well, we think it's going up. And I think maybe that was a pretty good bet to make, but the market is constantly pricing in where the where it thinks that interest rates are going because rates are ebbing and flowing is the same way that they do in stocks. You look at the short-term rates right now and they're pretty high. You go back to the over 4% um, short-term target that we have. Well, you look at the longer term and the rates don't look as good. So Really? So you give someone money for a longer period of time and you don't get paid more for that extra risk you're taking on? Yeah, that's a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? It's what they call yield curve inversion. Oh boy, let the <laughs> jargon start now. You know, we can get really nerdy on this, but just at a high level, it, it means what I just said. The long-term bonds are paying you less than the short-term bonds. Generally, the curve, yield curve, how much you get paid on short-term versus long-term, and it kind of just gets graphed out. The longer-term bonds pay you more, so the yield curve looks steep. Right now, we have the opposite of that. Short-term rates are higher than the long-term rates, and that just means that expectations in the future are lower. And it, it's generally been an indication of a uh, recession. To, we did have some of our colleagues, as I mentioned earlier, they did a whole podcast on this and obviously went into a lot more detail than we'll go about here. But it's not just interest rates. It's not just the yield curve. It's not just short-term rates that, that matter. You also need to understand credit quality, whether a bond is taxable or not. And um, that also impacts how much you get paid for a bond. It's not just the base rates that you get paid in a treasury. You need to also look at the credit quality of the issuer as well. You know, we can talk all day about bonds, right, Dave? <laughs> yeah, and it's no different for borrowers and savers. Those that have worse credit have to pay higher rates for that higher risk that you take on. And when you're lending money, it's that same dynamic. The better credit quality, the lower the rate. And if it's not as good, then obviously you have to pay more for the market to purchase that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about stocks too. The relationship between interest rates and bonds seems pretty clear. Help me understand how interest rates can impact stocks over time as well. Well, stocks are riskier than bonds. And it hasn't seemed that way when the stock market has just gone up, 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 up. Well, that's obviously changed this year. Interest rates, if they impact bonds, then they are going to impact stocks. You kind of look at the trade-off between a bond versus a stock. A lot of stocks pay you some yield as well. They'll pay little payments called dividends. And now investors are looking at that and saying, well, do I want some dividend yield or do I want this higher interest rate? Well, for the longest time, they were about equal. And now bonds are finally paying higher yields than stocks. So you look at a riskier investment like the stock market, you compare it to a safer investment like bonds, and you say, well, okay, bonds are starting to look more attractive. And as such, you have a lot of money flowing out of stocks and starting to go into 
bonds or cash or safe havens for people who are following the the weather pattern, so to speak. So, but there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off because stocks are riskier than bonds. The price fluctuations in stocks are higher than in bonds general, generally, but bonds and bonds pay out first in the case of a bankruptcy. So let's say a company goes bust. It's the bond holders who are going to get paid. The stockholders are going to be left with nothing if the equity in the company isn't worth anything. But why do you take the risk? Well, the longer term return profile is better for stocks than bonds. So it's kind of this uh, trade-off we have to keep in mind. Yeah. And a 4% bond is better than a 2% bond when you're the one lending the money. But if inflation's at 8%, are you just losing safely? <laughs> Good point. Good point. I kind of think about our, we were talking about borrowers and the amount of interest that they're paying. Well, think about the money that that these companies are paying, they have to borrow too. They Absolutely. have their own quote, quote, mortgages to pay. They have to borrow money to fund projects. They So their cost of capital, as, as it's called, has gone up. That impacts expenses. And therefore that floats down to the amount of earnings and future cash flows. So without going too much in the weeds on that, higher interest rates can put pressure on stock prices. Well, we've uh, clearly seen that interest rates permeate all facets of our financial lives, whether it's individuals, borrowers, savers, companies, individuals. It's just a, a really wide impact that we've seen with these increasing interest rates. Are there any silver linings in these higher rates, Rachel? I mean, yes, I think so, Dave. You look at the what savers and investors are finally getting rewarded with. It's better yields. It's better prices for stocks than before. I mean, all of that is contingent on how earnings hold up, of course, but it, this has been long overdue. We've been in a period of 20 years of interest rate decline, and now we're seeing it's kind of painful to go up the other side of it, but it's a correction to more reasonable valuations, and that is certainly welcomed by us and by investors. Yeah, for the longest time, the last 20 years, you say it's it's really favored the borrowers and now it's the tables have turned and the savers are getting paid something. It would sure be nice though if the change were a little more gradual. <laughs> I think a lot of people are really shocked and maybe even scared about what's been happening. Yeah, and until inflation gets under control, that right. rapidly rising rates is what the Fed's using to try to get that get inflation cooled off. Yeah. yeah. Shocks in inflation, shocks in interest rates can make markets a little bumpy. A little, a little, a little, a little <laughs> slash a lot <laughs> bumpy. But hey, we're long term investors. We're here in it for the long haul. And most of the people we work with are too. So we'll get through it. Rachel and Dave, how can somebody reach you if they want to discuss this some more? Sure. You can find out more about Foster and Motley at our website www.fosterandmotley.com. And we can be reached for those that still use a phone. Our phone number is 513-561-6640. And for more on this discussion and many other topics, follow this Foster and Motley podcast about life and wealth. If you found the information intriguing, thought-provoking, please share with others. I'm Patrice Sakora, and thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information discussed and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Foster and Motley. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Keep in mind that rules and regulations are subject to change. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions regarding your financial planning and investments. Foster & Motley is not affiliated with any third-party providers. Any mention of a third-party provider does not imply an endorsement of that provider. If you decide to utilize a third-party provider, you do so at your own risk.